Well, if you turn in your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14 is the longest um, chapter in the book of Mark, and so we'll be spending, I'm sure, some significant time in this book. Um, Of the 661 verses in the book of Mark, a full uh, third of those actually cover the final days of Jesus in Jerusalem, and a full sixth of those verses cover the last 24 hours uh, because of the fact that Mark writes this gospel. He is writing about the good news, and the good news is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is the heart of the gospel. That is where we are coming to today in Mark chapter 14. We're going to look, God willing, this morning at verses 1 to 11, if you allow me to read these verses. It was now two days before the Passover in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever The gospel is proclaimed in the whole world. What she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Well, when the unbelieving world evaluates the devoted life of the Christian, their conclusion, as we've seen, is often that such have wasted their life. And yet when we as believers in Jesus Christ evaluate the lives of those who are not following Christ, our conclusion is that they are wasting their lives. And so the question, therefore, is not in the sense, will you waste your life? The question is, rather, how will you waste your life? And our text this morning answers us in a way that we should embrace. We should so-called waste our life by pouring it out in devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. With the commencement of chapter 14, with these words, it was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I think that's a very significant statement. It's now two days before everything that Mark has been working towards is going to come to pass. As early as chapter 1 and verse 22, we begin to see tensions rising from the authorities in Jerusalem towards Jesus. When the crowd say in chapter 1 that Jesus speaks with authority, not like the scribes. Later on in chapter 2, when Jesus heals a man um, and actually says, your sins are forgiven, the scribes are most upset about that, saying, who can forgive sins but God only? In chapter 3, the Herodians, they seek to destroy Jesus. In chapter 3, the Pharisees from Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, they declare that Jesus is possessed of demons. In chapter 7, Jesus confronts the religious leaders who've come from Jerusalem, and and he says to them that they are corrupt in their heart. In chapter 8, in Caesarea Philippi, 
Jesus says to the disciples that they are going to Jerusalem and he will be killed by the elders and the scribes and the chief priests. He repeats that again in chapter 9 and verse 31. He repeats that again in chapter 10 and verse 33. In chapter 12 and verses 1 to 12, he says to the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests, he gives them a parable about the vineyard and he identifies them as the tenants who rise up and kill the son of the owner of the vineyard. Clearly, they understood he was speaking about them. In chapter 13, he speaks about the destruction of the Jerusalem, of, of the temple. And earlier in chapter 11, when he goes to the temple and cleanses it, in verse 18, they determine they're going to destroy him. But now, after all those three years of the building of the tension, we're down to the final two days. In these final two days, the evil plot of the religious leaders is going to be hatched. And Jesus Christ is going to be crucified. And in the story before us this morning, particularly in verses 3 to 9, about this woman, Mary, who pours her devotion upon the Lord, we see the glimpse of this glorious gospel. And so this morning, as we begin our study in chapter 14 and 15, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, we begin by looking at this story of how to really waste your life. I've divided this passage into three points, and the first one is simply this, the timing of Jesus' death. The timing of Jesus' death. Verses 1 and 2. Look at verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let me just pause there for a moment. The Passover, of course, was very significant in the life of the nation of Israel. It was instituted in Exodus chapter 12. It was that night where God had told the Israelites to bring a lamb and to keep it in their home for several days beforehand. And on the night of the Passover, they were to take the lamb and they were to, 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 to slaughter that lamb. They were to take the blood and apply it at the lintel of the door as well as on the side post. They were then to, uh, to, to eat the, the, the meat of the lamb. They could share that amongst households, depending on how big the households were. But that night, as the angel of the Lord came through and destroyed the first, firstborn in Egypt, he did not destroy the, ho- the firstborn in the homes where the blood had been applied and where the lambs had been appropriated. Well, now the ultimate Passover is going to take place. The Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. He is going to come and he is going to shed his blood. And all those to whom he applies his blood and all those who appropriate the Lamb of God too will be delivered from God's wrath. The timing of this was orchestrated by God from before the foundation of the world. That first Passover so long ago was simply another step towards the Lamb of God who would come. The Lamb, as Revelation 13, 8 tells us, was slain before the foundation of the world. Well, now that time has come. It's two days. It's the Wednesday before Passover. And look at the rest of the verse. And the chief priest and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth. That is, by cunning and to kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Jesus Christ is very, very popular. And as we've seen over and over again, particularly since chapter 11, that Jerusalem has, has, has swelled in population. You'll remember that there were three times where the, 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 the male heads of households were to come to Jerusalem to celebrate a feast. The Passover is one of those. And at Passover, Jerusalem was filled with people, and many, many people have come from Galilee. And Jesus is very popular in Galilee. So there's a, there's a large following, as it were, who are following Messiah, many of them with wrong motives. We've, we've seen that. But the, the, but the religious leaders understand that if they were to rise up and kill Jesus during this time where there's all these Galileans, they're going to have a riot on their hands. That's what they are assuming. And so their plan is, let's get through the Passover. 
Let's get through the, five, the, the next seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And after that, we will kill Jesus. But in all of this, they didn't reckon on God's sovereign hand. God is working his plan. They want to wait, but God's not going to allow it to wait. It's interesting how Peter picks up on this in Acts chapter 2, and we just briefly touched on it uh, last week on Pentecost Sunday. But listen to these words in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Peter preaching, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, listen to this, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. But what I want to call our attention to is this, this phrase here. This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God who they crucified. God's timing from eternity past was that his son would be crucified as a substitutionary sacrifice for all those he came to save at Passover. And so even though these religious leaders wanted to avoid that, God wouldn't let it happen because God was behind this all the way. There's so much here, and I won't spend a lot of time here, though I'd like to, but just seeing the sovereignty of God in our redemption and being reminded that that, that the timing of God is always perfect. Always. I was um, reading a couple of years ago a story of a man by the name of Mitsuo Fuchida. Mitsuo Fuchida was the, the lead pilot of all the Japanese fighter, fighter planes that attacked Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941, which brought the United States into the World War II. And this pagan man led the attack on America. And after the war, his life began to really fall apart. But he, in an amazing way, there were several, he tried to kill himself, and God didn't let him kill himself. He was actually, before the war ended, he was in Hiroshima the day before the bomb was dropped. He was in the very center of where that bomb would have dropped. But for some reason, he got called back to Tokyo that the very day before, and God spared his life. And a couple of years after that, in an amazing story of God's grace, God saved Masudo Fuchida. He became a friend of Billy Graham. He began to preach the gospel in the United States, the very place that he had attacked. And when you read the man's life story, you see that God's hand of his timing in all of this. If, if, if this... Mark 14 and the death of Christ teaches us, teaches us many things. But one of those things it teaches us is God's sovereign plan, God's sovereign hand. God used the, uh, the, the hands of evil men, but it was God's arm behind it all. His timing is always perfect. Well, the timing of Jesus' death, and you read here about this murderous attempt, in, uh, attempt at Jesus. They, they desire to kill him. But now we have in what is another one of those so-called Markan sandwiches. You see this throughout the book of Mark, where Mark will begin a theme, then he kind of interrupts it, then he comes back to that theme. In the first two verses, he's telling us about the conniving plan of the religious leaders to kill Jesus. In verses 10 to 11, we see how this plan begins to be hatched when Judas Iscariot um, goes to the chief priest and, and, all, and in return for money offers to betray Jesus. But in between that, we have the, the, the meat of the sandwich, as it were, this story of this woman who comes and pours out her uh, lavish love on the Lord. And I've called this section the triumph of Jesus' death. And you say, well, why would you call it the triumph of Jesus' death? Well, before, without giving it all away, it's because in this story, we are reminded of the fact that the gospel is going to be preached to all the world, which means this, that even though Jesus knew he was going to die, 
Jesus knew he would rise again from the dead. Now, this woman, who we know from John chapter 12, is Mary. She comes to Jesus, and she offers to him a very, very lavish gift. She bestows, she is accused of wasting much on him. Somebody has helpfully pointed out that when you take verses 1 and 2 and then you shift to this story, that we see the, the pure devotion of this woman throwing into bold relief the hostility and the treachery of the priest and their accomplices. In other words, not everybody hated Jesus. This woman didn't. Look at verse 3. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There are several things about this. We see here something glorious about the, the demeanor of Jesus. We've seen ever since chapter 11 that Jesus would come into Jerusalem. He'd come into the temple. He'd spend some time teaching. Then at night, he'd go back to Bethany. And he probably stayed with Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Well, two days before the Passover, Jesus is back in Bethany. And the Bible says in this point, he is in the house of Simon the leper. He's gone for a meal. Who was Simon the leper? We don't know who Simon the leper was. We do know he was a man that, at least at one time, had a problem. He was an outcast. He was considered unclean. To be called Simon the leper was not something that was a compliment. To be called Simon the leper meant that he would have been seen by society as an outcast. And it's just so lovely to me, as I've been meditating upon this this week, that Jesus is two days away from his death, and he knows that. And yet he's still doing what he's been doing for three years. He's ministering to the outcast. He is showing compassion to those that others would just exclude. And he's invited to this meal in Bethany of the home of Simon the leper. And there's others there. We know from John chapter 12 that Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they are there. And he's reclining there, and that was the, the way you ate a meal. And you see pictures in the, uh, of those ancient days where they would kind of lounge as they would eat. Jesus, as it were, is relaxing amongst friends, including his disciples. And while he was there, for some reason, Mark doesn't mention her name, and I'll deal with that at the end of this message. He just simply mentions that a, a woman comes with an alabaster flask. We see here the devotion of a sister in Christ. In chapter 12, you remember when, or in chapter 3, remember when people came and said, your mother and your brother are outside waiting for you. And Jesus said, who is my brother and my mother and my sister? It's those who do the will of God. Well, here is a real sister in the Lord. We know her again as, as Mary, and she comes with this alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard. Alabaster was a soft white marble found in that part of the world. Because it was so soft, it could be carved out into containers. It was often used for these kind of very precious perfumes. Nard was a perfume, a fragrance that came from India. And as we're told in the text, it was worth quite a bit of money. 300 denarii was equal to a, a, a year's wage, wages for a laborer. And she comes with this very expensive ointment, and she, with great abandon, she breaks the flask. And, and, and when you look at pictures of the ancient flask, it would be like a, kind of like a, 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 a box that have a long neck coming out of it. Now, obviously, if it had a neck coming out, if it had an opening, she could have just poured some of that, but she didn't pour it. She broke the neck in just great, lavish abandon and extravagant gift. She pours it on the head of Jesus. John tells us that she also used her hair to, to wipe and anoint his feet with this. Now, I don't want to rush through this. I want us to get a, a good mental picture of what is happening here, that here is Jesus eating meal with Simon the leper, 
He's eating a meal, we know, with the disciples. And amongst all these men, who are pretty strong men, here comes this woman, and she just kind of, she, Mary comes along, and she, with utter abandon, she kind of interrupts the meal, and she does something that seems so outlandish, and she breaks the neck, and she pours it on the Lord. Here was a woman who really just didn't care what others were thinking. Here was a, a woman who really, with great boldness, was showing her devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And she pours it on his head. And as she does so, there is great, great devotion coming from her heart. And Jesus sees that. By the way, it's interesting to note that this flask with this very expensive perfume, many commentators say that um, in those days, sometimes that was seen as a bit of an insurance policy because it was worth so much money. Because it, was, because it was so valuable. If a family came into great financial need, they could actually sell that in order to help themselves financially. So it gave them financial security. And these kind of flasks with this in, in expensive ointment was like a family heirloom. Well, here was Mary, who, as it were, was just, and, and I love the picture, as she breaks the neck of the flask, this is something that can't be used again. She's giving it all. There's no turning back. It's as, she, it's as she was saying, my security doesn't lie within this. My security lies within the one that I'm giving it to. She was, with great abandon, commit, committing not only her present, but her future to the Lord Jesus Christ. She was not calculating in her devotion. R. Ken Hughes paints a, a kind of a humorous picture and says that, you know, when Mary came with this, she didn't just pour out a little drop and put it on his head, a little drop for, for his left foot and a drop for his, le- for his right foot. She pours it all. She gives it in utter abandon. Here was a woman who, out of no doubt great gratitude for the Lord Jesus Christ, for some understanding of what he was going to be going through for her, was willing to pour out her all for him. By the way, as Jesus will mention when he rebukes the disciples, he says that she has come to anoint his body for the bearing. You know, it's interesting, and I've already mentioned this in chapter 8, in chapter 9, in chapter 10. Jesus told the disciples quite clearly that he was going to die. In John chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother, from the dead, after that, the religious leaders then plotted to put him to death because he was becoming so popular. No doubt Mary knew that. Mary was paying attention to to why Jesus came, that he came to die. And while the disciples were so busy arguing about who's going to be the greatest, Mary was paying attention to the gospel. She was paying attention that Jesus Christ was going to die. And in some way, perhaps by the Holy Spirit, he moves her that this is your last opportunity. He's going to die soon. And she pours out this great devotion. She understands from, from John chapter 11. She understood. She even says, I know you're the resurrection and the life. She knows that. And so because of that, she, out of great love, extravagant appreciation for his grace, she pours everything she has, as it were, onto him. Great, lavish love because she herself was lavishly loved by Jesus. This woman is deeply devoted and a wonderful testimony for you and I that we should so love and live for the Lord that we will lavishly pour out our lives to Him. When we realize what Christ has done for us, like my friend Bill, We are willing to sacrifice it all, to leave it all behind, no turning back, and give our all to Jesus Christ. Not everybody was impressed with this because we see the disgust of the disciples in verses 4 and 5. There were some who said to themselves indignantly. That is a strong, strong word. It means to be deeply disturbed. It means to be really churned up. It means to be angered. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? 
For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. The word scold there, you could, you could, actually the word means to snort like a horse. They're, They're growling at her. In a real sense, I think they are seeking to intimidate this poor, godly, devoted woman. Now, we know, by the way, and Mark isn't bringing this out now. This is not his emphasis, but just to fill in the gaps. We know from John chapter 12, it was Judas who was a spokesman. And we're told in John chapter 12 that he did this because he was a thief. And he was pilfering all the time, the offering. So Judas saw this as a waste. He's saying, you know what? We could have used that, and I could have gotten some of that for myself. But clearly, they're all indicted in this. And some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? And Jesus hears that. Jesus hears that. Jesus, who for three years has been compassionately meeting the needs of those he's ministering to. Jesus, who for three years has been caring for these disciples. For three years, Jesus has been forgiving these disciples for their knuckleheadedness. For three years, Jesus has been showing them clearly that he is the Son of God, and they deem it a waste for this woman to give it all to him? They do some virtue signaling here. They say, for this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. All of a sudden, they have a great burden for the poor. Now, I don't want to be too hard on them, but I also don't want to let them off the hook. At Passover, there was a custom that gifts were given to the poor. Uh, in celebration of what God had done redeeming the nation, they would oftentimes give special gifts to the poor. And so their concept of giving to the poor at this time of the year was not unfounded. But I don't think that was the whole motive here. I think they really didn't realize that Jesus Christ deserved it all. They were more calculating, as it were, in their devotion. This woman was uncalculating. She was lavish in her devotion. But they are so deeply concerned about this waste. Again, can I just say this by way of application? That when we go over the top, as it were, and you can never really do that, but when we, in the world's eyes, and even in the religious world's eyes, when we go over the top, people think that we are wasting our lives. I appreciate what James Edward who's written a great commentary on Mark, says, he said, the world has never had a problem with religion in moderation. It has no problem with too much wealth or power or sex. It only has a problem with too much religion. Well, Mary had too much religion for them. She poured it all, and the world, and even the religious world, sometimes just say, you're fanatical. You mean you go to church, well, not now, but you go to church twice on a Sunday? You actually go to a grace group. You give all your time. You give a tithe of your income to the church. That's over the top. I've been in email contact with a a brother the last 24 hours uh, from America. And he and his family are planning on moving to uh, Turkey uh, as missionaries. And um, I wrote him just yesterday and said, is the plan still on with the, the virus going on? And he wrote me today and he said, yes. He said, last week they packed up their house and he said, pray that we, can, we want to be there no later than the middle part of July. This brother is in his early, maybe nearing mid-50s. He has three youngish children. I think his oldest is, is a young teenager. He has all kinds of security in the United States. Why would a man in his 50s take his family to another country? You know, many of the people would say, you're wasting your life. Don't you know at this age you should be working towards retirement? Why is this brother doing this? Why is this family doing this? Because they understand the lavish love of God in their own life. And they're willing to do that. We too need to live such lives that we can be accused of wasting ourselves. In fact, I think if we're living such a life that's so calculated, 
that people can understand that, then maybe we're not loving Christ enough. We should be living a life so extravagantly dedicated and devoted to Christ that people scratch their heads and say, that guy and that gal, they are wasting themselves. They talk about the poor. They talk about the poor and the concern for the poor. We'll come back to that in a moment. But can I just pause here and just address something very pastoral. There were some who said to themselves, it wasn't just Judas. There's no doubt disciples are involved in this. Mark or Matthew makes that point as well. And they scold her, they growl at her. Again, think about the courage. Think about the conviction. Think about the boldness that it took for Mary to do this. She's coming to show great love to Christ, and these guys, all they can do is scold her. You know what? They may have disagreed with how she was spending her money. They may have disagreed with her expression of her religious devotion. Fair enough. You're entitled to your opinion. But they should have treated her with decency. You know, there is just so much ugliness right now happening in the Christian world by so-called Christians who are concerned about, about how people are responding to those who are outcast. The way people are responding to those who are vulnerable. The way people are responding to those who are disadvantaged. And we have these camps, and we have the social justice warriors, and we have those on the other side who are uh, uh, criticizing that. And there's all this ugliness going on. Can I just suggest to you that, that we need to be very careful. We're allowed to disagree with how people express their Christian faith. And, and more than that, sometimes we have a responsibility to disagree, but we should do so with decency. They could have pulled Mary aside and said, you know, why did you do that? And by the way, they probably would have learned something. They probably would have went away, as they're going to go away here, shamed by the Lord Jesus Christ. They would have gone away humbled. You know, there's a way to confront those that you disagree with. Proverbs 15.1 speaks about a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. There's a way to approach those you disagree with. I have often thought of Proverbs twelve eighteen. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. You may disagree with how someone is expressing their devotion to Jesus Christ, and you may have a right to do that, and they might even be wrong. Certainly she wasn't. But we need to be decent in how we respect how we speak to them. Well, Jesus was. And Jesus comes to her defense in verses six in verses six to following. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. And the tone there, I'm sure, was strong. Leave her alone. He is coming to the defense. Here is the good shepherd who is protecting one of his sheep. Here is the chief shepherd who's coming and, and protecting one of his lambs from other lambs that have grown fangs. He says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. A beautiful thing. Why was it a beautiful thing? Why was it a virtuous thing, a valuable thing, the word can mean? Why was it? Can I suggest to you that Jesus saw this act of Mary, as a beautiful thing, because first of all, it was motivated by love. It was a lavish love. It was someone who had experienced the lavish love of the Savior, who was who was responding in kind. As I mentioned earlier, I think it was beautiful because it was something that, as John Calvin mentions, that perhaps the Spirit of God has given her a particular insight about the soon death of Jesus Christ. And so he sees this as a spiritual act of worship. Paul will write to believers who have experienced the lavish love of God. And he will say, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service. 
I think Jesus thought it was beautiful because it was spontaneous. It wasn't calculating. She wasn't measuring out the drops. It was lavish. It was loving. It was spirit-driven. And sometimes when things are spirit-driven, it is spontaneous. You know, we would all do well as Christians to, to be a little bit more spontaneous instead of more calculating. Saying, you know what, instead of just giving this amount uh, this month, I'm going to be giving this amount because there's greater needs. And you know what, it may not make sense, but I'm going to trust my future, my security to God. I'm going to be spontaneous, and I'm going to give it all. I've known friends who have at times emptied their savings account to give to the cause of missions spontaneously. Why? Because of a love for God. Spontaneous living. A spontaneous witness at work tomorrow. You maybe you never shared the gospel with your friend, but you say, you know what? I have an opportunity and I'm going to spontaneously just speak this truth to them. It was loving. It was spirit initiated. It was spontaneous. And again, it was sacrificial. It was beautiful. He said, why do you trouble her? You guys have said this could have been sold and given to the poor, but she's done a beautiful thing to me. For verse 7, you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. Jesus here is quoting from Deuteronomy 15, 11, where God told the nation of Israel that you will always have poor in your land. And in that passage, God says to the nation, you're responsible for the poor that are in your land. So Jesus is not saying here that this is an either or. What he's saying is, yes, it's right to care for the poor. And you're going to have plenty of opportunity to do that. But right now, there's an opportunity that you will not have again. You know, I think Mary gave so lavishly because she had a spiritual insight that actually Paul will refer to in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. When Paul wrote about the generous giving of the Macedonian Christians, he uses Jesus Christ as the example. He says in chapter 8, 8 and verse 9 of 2 Corinthians, that he who was rich became poor so that we through his poverty could be made rich. I want you to understand this, that there was nobody, in a sense, there was nobody in this house of Simon the leper that was more poor than Jesus Christ. Because according to Philippians chapter 2, When Jesus came to earth, he emptied himself. He didn't cease to be God, but he emptied himself of the the royal robes, as it were. He emptied himself of the rights to deity and became a man. Nobody ever walked this earth more poor than Jesus Christ. Mary understood that. If you want to talk about poor, here is one who became ultimately poor. He's so poor spiritually that he would take upon his shoulders, upon his life, the sins of the world and cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was the poorest person in Jerusalem. Mary was indeed giving to the poor. She understood that. Again, Jesus is saying, you're going to have opportunity to care for the poor. But can I suggest to you, as I suggested when we studied chapter 12, remember the, that widow at the end of, the sto- end of chapter 12? She only had two mites, less than a penny. And she gives that to the Lord, and Jesus says she's given more than everybody's given and even though she gave so, such a small amount materially, she gave it all. And as I mentioned then, that though she gave so little, though it was her all, how many millions and millions and millions of rands have gone to the cause of Christ because of that? As people read that story and been motivated. 
How many people are, are going to read this story? And hopefully after today, after we've taught it, we're going to be exposed to this woman who they said, you wasted this. It could have been given to the poor, but because of her lavish love, moving us to lavish love makes us more generous to the poor. Jesus wasn't saying this is an either or. Can I share with you the words of R. Kent Hughes? who says it is impossible to be true disciples without serving others. Jesus here is not diminishing our obligation to care for the poor. Rather, in saying, whenever you want, you can do to them good, he is implying ongoing responsibility to help the poor. Our Lord's commendation of Mary for putting him above all else properly understood, condemned in either or approach to spirituality. Christians are to worship God and minister to others. The ideal is a lavish, contemplative, devotional life in which we love Christ so much that we pour ourselves out for others. One without the other falls short of the dynamic that Christ wants for us. In other words, it's not an either or. As we love Christ with abandon, we will care for those who are in need. Mary understood something about that. Look at verse 9. Look what happens. He says in verse 8, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Can I just pause you for a moment? This is significant because when people died of natural death in the Jewish culture, they were anointed before they were buried. But when you died as a criminal, you did not get that kind of a burial. You didn't get that kind of a service. And so it's as though Mary has some kind of an indication. She's taken seriously the words she's heard by him that he's going to be killed. He's going to be killed by the chief priests and scribes. She understands he's going to be killed as a criminal. And Jesus understood that. So he says, leave her alone. She has come to anoint my body before the burial because I'm not getting one afterwards. Because I'm going to die treated as an outcast. If that doesn't move us to a lovish laugh, love for Christ, I don't know what will. But he commends her. And he says, and truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memorial of her. There's a couple interesting things about this. Jesus has already said in Matthew, in Mark chapter 13, in the Olivet Discourse, he said that, This gospel will be preached amongst all the nations. Here, Jesus talking about his death is also talking about his resurrection because the gospel, the good news, is not just that Christ died for our sins. Thank God for that. But if he didn't rise from the dead, there'd be no good news. In fact, if the book of Mark stops in chapter 15, we don't have a gospel. We need the resurrection of chapter 16. Jesus says, guys, the next two days are going to be really bad. But there's going to be good news. Because I'm going to rise, and this gospel is going to be proclaimed, and you're going to proclaim it. And when you do, I want the testimony of this woman proclaimed. Why was that? It's because... Jesus has been teaching the disciples all through the book of Mark, particularly heightens that teaching from chapter 8, that if you're going to follow him, you must take up your cross to do so. You must die to self. You must take up your cross and be willing to be crucified and die and to pay the price to follow him. Mary, this woman, this unnamed woman by Mark, does just that. She shows utter abandon in following Christ. And so he says, when you go and you preach the gospel and people want to follow me, you need to tell them that if you follow, that that Jesus Christ expects for you to pour your all in devotion to following him. There's a memorial here. It's interesting that John mentions her name, but he doesn't mention this memorial. Matthew and Mark, recording this same story, 
don't mention Mary's name, but they speak about the, the, the memorial. So that means when, the, when the, the readers of Mark's gospel get this gospel, long before they get John's gospel, they go a long time not knowing who this woman was. And I love that. Because Jesus' point here was not to make a celebration out of Mary. It was to make a celebration out of the gospel. And I don't have time to develop that. But there's a whole lot of ungodly Christian celebrityism, if that's a word, going on today. This is not about drawing attention to Mary. This is about drawing attention to her act of devotion and that every Christian needs to be challenged by her lavish love. That is how we are supposed to live. So he says, I say to you, leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing. So beautiful that wherever the good news of my death and my burial and my resurrection is, is, is preached, wherever there's going to be disciples, disciples following me, they need to be taught that I expect them to pour their all out in devotion to me. In other words, Jesus is saying, the world might say that she has wasted her life, but she has the applause of heaven. And finally and briefly, we have the treachery of Jesus' death. With this sandwich, verses 1 and 2, talking about the, the, the evil intent of the religious leaders. And then we have this beautiful picture in between. We now come back to a kind of an ugly piece of bread here, verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, and I agree with one commentator who said, these are the most bitter words in the book of Mark. And when they heard it, they were glad. That word glad is actually a word taken over by Christians. It's a word that means to be happy, to, be, to celebrate. They're not celebrating the gospel here. They're celebrating they're going to put him to death. When they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And from this point on, he seeks an opportunity to betray him. In these final two verses, we see the real waste. In fact, if I was to rename this point, it would be simply this. What a waste. What a waste. Judas has spent three years with the Lord. And we learn from his behavior here the proximity to Jesus does not guarantee faithfulness. Here is Judas who has had received the teaching from the very mouths of Jesus. You have a, if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, I often think of this. Every time Jesus spoke, it was like red letters were coming out of his mouth. He's God. And here he is, every, he's speaking, he's teaching. Judas has opportunity to see the signs that he's Messiah. Judas hears this truth. He's so close, and yet he's eternally far away. And we don't know all the motives behind this. I suspect, and I don't think I'm off the mark on this, I suspect it's because his idea, idea of Messiah was completely worldly. And since Messiah was not coming to, 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 to knock the lights out of the Roman, soul, the Roman Empire... Since particularly chapter 13, Jesus makes it clear that the kingdom is going to look very different than what they suspected. Judas has just had enough and he says, I will betray him. I'm done with this man. What a waste. We move from this beautiful scene of eternal vindication, eternal commendation to one of eternal condemnation. Because we know Judas does not repent and he dies and he goes to hell. Can I just say this as I wrap this up? Those who are false followers of Jesus, if they don't repent, they will fall away. I was in a radio interview this week with another, uh, another pastor from Pretoria. And the question they had asked us was about what, how do we respond to uh, 
uh, in recent days, I don't know the, the Christian singing group, but I think their lead singer has apostatized that he's no longer a Christian, no longer believes in God. We know the sad story about Josh Harris abandoning the faith completely and others. And so they were asking questions around this. And they were they're talking about what leads to this. And uh, what can we say to, to Christians in these times? And one of my responses was simply this, is that when you read the New Testament and you read about what a Christian is, a Christian is someone who sweats a lot. The words that Paul uses to describe followers of Christ, he uses words like agonizomai, agony. He uses words that speak of, of working to the point of exhaustion. He speaks about running a race. He speaks about a boxing, a fighting match. He speaks about, about conflict. And, and, and the point I was to be making was this, is that we need to realize that following Christ is not easy. And I don't know all that goes on behind in a person's life, why they abandon Christ. But maybe in many cases, they start off with a false view of Messiah, thinking this is all going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be hardship. But as Christians, we look to Christ and we persevere lovingly, lavishly, like this woman did. At great abandon, at great cost. And as we do so, as we persevere to the end, we will be saved. And there will be an eternal reward. Christian brother, Christian sister, persevere in looking to Christ. Well, our faithful Christian sister in this story was accused of waste, but the one in this passage which was guilty of waste was Judas. And let me ask you as I conclude, how will you waste your life? That is, by whose definition? Christian, keep counting the cost and realize that the promised dividend is worth it. And though the world calls grace a waste, keep pouring all you have and all you are in wasting yourself in lavish love and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of the cost, regardless of the criticism, even the criticism of a religious world. But if you are not a Christian, may I appeal to you, may I plead with you, may I beg you today, don't waste your life. Don't waste your eternity. Don't throw away your opportunity to be forgiven by God and reconciled to Him through the Lord Jesus Christ. For if you continue to live without Him, you will die without Him. You will waste not only this life, but you will be wasting an eternity separated from loving, holy God. Judas couldn't tell the difference between grace and waste. I hope you can. Christian, I know I've concluded about ten times this morning, but can I conclude one more time? One thing that I've been meditating on this morning, and I may come back to this. Here was a woman who had experienced lavish love from God, and so she lavishly loved Christ back. We who have experienced the lavish, lavish grace of Christ, we're called to live with the lavish grace graciousness to others. May God empower us by His Holy Spirit to break the flask of our lives off and to pour ourselves into forgiving others, into being gracious to others, and seeking to live out the truth of the gospel, and seeking to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that lavish grace of which He purchased and secured for us On that cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So you can save sinners. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this glorious example of a sister in Christ. Lord, who who got it in the midst of a bunch of brothers in Christ who didn't. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to live our lives in total abandon to you, being moved by your love, to love you extravagantly. Oh, Lord, as we have experienced your grace, please, may we be gracious to others. I'm grieved 
As I read this story, and these disciples have experienced so much kindness from you, and they were so hard on their sister. Oh, Lord, deliver us from that. And Lord, may our lives be a sweet aroma as they are poured out in love to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.